With the rising popularity of film in the recent years, it can be quite difficult to find an affordable camera. On top of that, one with a small barrier to entry that is still working and good quality is another challenge in and of itself. In this video, I'm going to be talking about around 10 cameras that are still good options in today's kind of inflated film camera market. First up are the Pentax P30 and P50. The P30, while it may feel like a cheap plastic camera, it has everything needed for a good, cheap beginner camera. From a large, clear viewfinder, accurate exposure meter, depth of field preview, self timer, a surprisingly good aperture priority auto exposure, and the K mount, which has access to a wide variety of lenses still today. A simple and stripped back manual focus camera that is cheap and easy to learn on. The P50 in large is very similar to the P30, with an updated body and aperture priority mode, which is quite a big difference maker as the P30 has no aperture priority mode at all. One big drawback for the cameras is neither can manually change the ISO, but by using the exposure compensation, you can adjust it up or down three stops. Both cameras come in around $50, with the P50 being considerably rarer and in some cases, significantly more expensive, which in that case, you're better off choosing a Pentax Super A if you're willing to pay that much more. Next up, the Minolta Maxim 7000. This Minolta is the world's first autofocus SLR. It's called the Dynax outside of the USA and the Maxim 7000 AF in Europe, but it's all ultimately the same camera. There were some earlier attempts at autofocus SLRs prior to the Maxim 7000, like the Nikon F3 AF, but they were all kludges with autofocus systems built into the lenses instead of the camera. The Maxim uses the Minolta A mount, which was introduced along with and lives to this day as Sony's alpha mount. Minolta Maxim AF lenses are fully compatible to the Sony alpha mount and Zeiss lenses for the Sony alpha likewise work great on the Maxim 7000. It has a good working light meter and can manually change the ISO. Equipped with a fast autofocus, aperture priority, shutter priority, and a max shutter speed of 1 2,000th of a second, it is a great camera to learn on with creative restraints and analog hand holding with its built-in systems. These come in around $50 with a lens from eBay. Next up, the Mamiya 1000 DTL. In 1970, the 1000 DTL would have been one of the most popular cameras. Sturdy, functional, the camera is reminiscent of the successful formula of SLRs seen throughout the following 40 years. An interesting thing that you'll have to learn with this camera is its light metering system between the average and spot metering. Thankfully, it's not too complicated and in fact, the TTL metering system is quite good in it. The camera is truly a simple one without many bells and whistles or flashy systems. With the 1000 DTL, you immediately run out of things to adjust, so you finally have to start thinking about your picture instead of thinking about your camera and menus, which results in better pictures. These can be found for around $60 today on eBay. Next, we have the Yashica FXD. The massively underrated Yashica FXD could be one of the best beginner film SLRs you could choose from. Yashica is a relatively ignored camera company in comparison to its other Japanese comrades and thus has a good amount of cheaper quality film cameras. The FXD is upon initial inspection a fairly run of the mill late 70s early 80s SLR and is a relatively compact and well built camera. It has a metal body to it, meaning the camera actually has a nice heaviness to it. Sadly, many of the soft vinyl that cover the camera today on most of the cameras have eroded away, but you can easily buy a pre-cut leather kit on the internet. While it only goes up to 1 1,000th of a second, it does have a changeable ISO dial up to 1600 and has both aperture priority and a faux manual mode. The center of the needle TTL meter system is also quite handy to have a metering system in-house. Lastly, it has a good selection of cheap lenses with great sharpness and color rendering so you could easily build out a nice little 35mm kit for yourself. You can find one of these with a lens for just under $100.
Now a very similar camera to the previous, the Ashika FX3. The FX3 is a manually operated camera that was released in 1979 to widespread popularity. It's extremely lightweight and compact for an SLR and only weighs about one pound. One of the greatest attributes of the camera is that it accepts all manual focus Yashica or contacts lenses, including the amazing Carl Zeiss T lenses that are intended to use for the contacts line. This allows you to get a superbly made and cheap 35mm body and link it to some of the best, sharpest lenses on the format. These cameras have developed a reputation for reliability and simplicity, mostly due to their extremely simple construction, durable metal chassis, manual control, and amazing lens selection. These come in just around $100 as well, but in my opinion are well worth the money. Next up, the Canonet QL17. During the 70s, the Canonet QL17 was a household name with over a million units sold. It's because it was a very small fixed rangefinder camera with a fast f1.7 40mm lens, auto exposure, and a hot shoe for a flash. While only using a max shutter speed of 1 500th of a second, it makes up for it with its quiet leaf shutter system meaning the shutter is in the lens and it's short focus range on the actual lens. It only needs a 45 degree turn to fully turn the focus so you can get really quick focusing action out of this. On top of that, the lens is surprisingly good and the camera is small enough to be pocketable which is a huge plus. This camera just screams fast moving street photography type work which I think would be most ideal type of photography when purchasing this camera. It comes in just at or right below $100, but again, I think it's worth it being at the ceiling of the budget. And lastly, the Canon AF35M. Canon claimed their AF35M, nicknamed the Auto Boy, was the world's first 35mm autofocus camera. Despite the claim, Konica made a camera two years prior that truly was the first autofocus camera. However, the Auto Boy was still one of the first and still innovative for the time. Because it is some of the most primitive autofocus technology, it isn't that great if the subject isn't center weighted. But there's a pretty easy workaround. You can pre focus with a self timer but obviously it's not super ideal. Kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of the last two or three cameras, I think this one would be good for taking photos of friends or around the house or of your family or informal experimental shots, etc. It doesn't have a ton of control and the ISO can only be set up to 400, but has a pretty decent 38 millimeter f2.8 lens on it. Additionally, the shutter and winding system is quite loud, so it may garner a decent amount of attention in public. You can find this autofocus point and shoot for around $40 to $60 if you're patient, but I wouldn't spend much more than that for this one, to be honest. Alright, so that's going to do it for my list of cameras. I made a handful of other videos similar to this one, but none under a certain price range. So this one was fun, and I think it's truly affordable for just about anyone who wants to give this hobby a try. If you haven't checked out my other 35mm one or my two other medium format ones, make sure you check those out. And I'm considering making another medium format cameras under a certain dollar amount because I think that truly would be worthwhile, especially if it's under two or $300. We'll see. Otherwise, that's gonna do it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you do like if it was helpful as it is helpful for me. Subscribe for more videos in the future. And until next time, peace out.